After Dwayne Haskins was benched back in week four, he got another chance this weekend against the Seahawks. Alex Smith hurt his calf, so Haskins started in his place. While the match did end closely, this was pretty much a one-sided game all the way through the third quarter. Washington was down 20-3, and even though they had two touchdown drives late in the game, it wasn't enough to put them over the top. In this video, I wanted to talk about Haskins. I wanted to break down what I saw, I wanted to look at the things that I liked, the things that I didn't like, and I also want to discuss how he's developed since I broke him down over the offseason. Before we begin though, we need to address the obvious elephant in the room. Haskins went to a strip club without wearing a mask the night after this loss. For a dude that was pretty much benched due to his maturity issues, this isn't exactly smart. It didn't alleviate those concerns. Frankly speaking, I feel like this might put the final nail in his coffin for his time in Washington. Regardless, and with that being said, I still wanted to look closely at this game. My question is should another team take a chance on him after Haskins was drafted in the middle of the first round just a season ago? Now, to start this game, Haskins threw eight passes in the first quarter. He completed five of them, but those went for a grand total of eight yards. While there were a number of factors for this, like the play called screens and the defense that the Seahawks were running, Haskins was pretty bad. He was inaccurate and he missed open receivers. Needless to say, it wasn't a good start. While we do need to point out areas where Haskins needs to improve, I also do need to give credit to players like Jamal Adams for his sack here. This is a thing of beauty. It really shows you how good the Seahawks defense was playing, especially in the first quarter. This sack came on third and 11 on Washington's second drive. The Seahawks had a single high safety deep and they had five men on the line of scrimmage. Meanwhile, Washington was an empty set shotgun. Washington ran a dagger concept on the left while they ran a pivot smash on the right. The left side is great to attack cover three and cover four defenses while the right is good against cover two. Haskins should start this play by looking left. This is exactly what he does here. Haskins is hoping that the dig route will get open against this defense. Since the Seahawks are running a cover three zone dog blitz, which is a three deep three under coverage, I want you to pay close attention to Adams at the bottom of your screen. His awareness and his reactions are seriously incredible in this one. After taking the snap, Haskins starts by looking to his left. Before he can move on to his next read though, he's already under pressure. The Seahawks collapsed the left side of the line of scrimmage. Somehow, Haskins was still able to escape. He got outside the pocket and he looked to scramble up the left sideline. This is really good so far. It's actually one of the main positives I have for Haskins. He's surprisingly good at sensing pressure. Now, at this point in the play, he might be able to scramble and pick up enough yards for a first down. Worst case, he's close and Washington could opt to go for it on fourth down. Now, instead of either of those things happening, Jamal Adams had other plans. From the complete opposite side of the entire field, Adams ran Haskins down. He literally ditched his own coverage responsibility in order to make this play. Seriously, I'm blown away by this one. How Adams recognized that there was no way Haskins was ever going to go back to the pivot route that he was covering, and then had the awareness and reaction to make this play were seriously awesome. This is elite level defensive play no matter how you slice it. We need to give Adams a ton of credit for this one. Now, I showed that previous play for the following reason. This defense and how Washington attacked them set the tone in the first quarter. Washington's game plan was pretty straightforward. A few outside zone runs by JD McKissick, a couple of RPO screens, and that was basically it. Honestly, Washington didn't really attack Seattle that much deep until they were behind on their downs, and Seattle did a really good job defending it. They did a great job of keeping everything in front of them. They tackled well, and this really slowed down this offense to a crawl. Now, as we make our way into the second and third quarters, Washington was able to string together a couple of longer drives. Two of them went for over 40 yards, where one ended in a field goal, while the other ended in an interception. Let's look at that pick closely. On a drive that started at Washington's 25-yard line, Haskins was actually doing well at hitting his receivers up to this point. Unfortunately, this throw simply got away from him. The Seahawks were dropping eight into coverage, while Washington once again lined up an empty set shotgun. After checking the post player, Haskins felt the pressure in front of him, so he decided to take off and scramble to his right. This is a good move. Similar to that last play that we talked about, I really do like how he extended his play. On this one, once he made it outside, he has plenty of space in order to create an off-script play. He's at the 35-yard line, but this play failed for two reasons. First, you have two receivers entering the same space. You have Isaiah Wright trying to get open on the scramble, while Cam Sims was coming back on a skinny post. The other thing you have is some god-awful footwork by Haskins. For no reason, he did this awkward jump pass thing all while drifting to his right. What kills me is that Haskins has plenty of space to plant and make his throw. Throughout this game and some of the others that I watched, he does this way too often. I think it's because he still doesn't know how to get his hips and momentum through his throw, but regardless, there's no reason for this motion. 
The reason why this bothers me is that if you don't have a consistent base as you make your throw, a quarterback will typically overcompensate with their arm. That's what I think happened here. That's why Haskins pass is too high and why it was slightly behind and why Wright couldn't bring it in. Now, before we move on, I do get the argument that if Wright never touched it, that Sims might have had a chance. He was directly behind this throw. However, I still put this on Haskins. Wright was open on the scramble drill underneath, and he should have been the target anyways. This pick is on him. Moving on, and for completeness, let's talk about his second interception that happened at the start of the third quarter. This pick came on one of the most classic play-action concepts called Yankee. Yankee features a post from the left and a deep over coming from the opposite side of the field. What happens is that the post will drag the outside cornerback and free safety backwards, while the deep over will try to find space between them and the underneath zones. Against a cover three defense like the one the Seahawks are playing, your goal as the quarterback is to watch that interaction between the free safety and the outside corner. If the free safety goes deep to bracket the post, you throw the over, while if the safety cuts the over, you then throw the post. At that point, the post will have inside leverage on the outside cornerback, and this will often result in a big play. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned that this is a pretty popular concept. Many offenses run this play. This means that DJ Reed on the outside will be looking for this after he drops deep. Reed is taught to keep outside leverage on the post, but he's also taught to key the eyes of the quarterback. That's what he does here. How he went from a full sprint to stopping in order to jump on this route is incredible. To have that level of play recognition to see what's coming while also having the ability to execute, this is seriously impressive. We need to give him a lot of credit for making this play. From Haskins' point of view though, this ball had to be out earlier. It also had to be driven harder if he wants to make this throw. Honestly, he should have just moved on to his check down on the left. He didn't need to force this pass. Again, even though this pick is a phenomenal defensive play, you still have to blame Haskins for this one as well. Generally speaking, and throughout this game, I saw some things from Haskins that I liked, and I also saw some things that I clearly didn't. For example, I really liked his ability to escape pressure and look to make plays off script. I also really liked his ability in the quick game in order to get the ball out fast. What I didn't like though, was that his accuracy was very hit or miss all game. I mentioned his accuracy on that first pick, but throughout this game, Haskins just didn't place the ball where it needed to be. His inconsistent footwork, as we've already talked about, where he doesn't bring his hips through the throw, were all on display here. The other thing that I noticed was that his vision was also pretty hit or miss. There were times where he had an open receiver, but he simply didn't throw it. An example of that can be seen back in the first quarter. On this one, we have a second and nine while the Seahawks were in cover two with two deep safeties. There is space in the seams where the two slot receivers are attacking on their digs. This is Robert Foster on the left, and you have Logan Thomas on the right. Hassan's goal against this defense is to first check the safeties, and then afterwards see if he can squeeze the pass between one of those zones. Watch closely at the right slot. Logan Thomas is actually open by the 40-yard line. Haskins has plenty of room to go through all of his reads, but for some reason he holds on to do it for far too long and he throws the deep ball to a covered JD McKissick on this one. Now, I do understand that Bobby Wagner is sitting there in his middle hook zone. Maybe Haskins was worried about that. However, there is a clear gap where Haskins has to take his shot. This is an NFL quality throw for pretty much every single quarterback out there. Yes, you definitely laud DJ Reed once again for making this play, but the ball should have gone to Logan Thomas in the first place. This, like some of the other plays I've already shown, is definitely on Haskins. Outside of this issue, the other thing I noted was that when Haskins wasn't running the quick game, he held onto the ball for far too long on too many of his plays. His timing was just off, and he was late even getting to his checkdowns. He didn't throw with any anticipation during this game. He consistently waited until the wide receiver broke or had a clear step on his defender before he would make his throw. To me, this is a lack of trust in his weapons. It's also a lack of trust in his scheme. Haskins needs to get the ball out sooner. If he throws with better timing, I promise you that he'll find more openings in this offense. Moving on, and before we end this breakdown, something I really wanted to look at was why the Seahawks allowed so many long drives in the second half of this game. After starting so well in the first half like we've already talked about, the defense allowed multiple long drives that kept Washington in this game. Yes, you can blame the Seahawks offense for stalling in the second half, but I felt like the defense also needed to play better as well. To me, a lot of this came to simply the play calls that Ken Norton Jr. was making. They played a lot of off and soft coverages late in this game. Where in the first half, they were pretty aggressive with their pattern match zones by playing man coverage, the second half was a ton of cover three soft zone. This allowed Haskins to complete a ton of quick passes underneath and allowed him to move the ball down the field pretty quickly. What's interesting is that my argument isn't a blitz in this situation. My reasoning is that since the offense struggled to create separation against tighter zone and man coverage, my argument is actually the opposite. I wanted to see more drop eight rush three coverages. I want to see them running a cover two drop eight or cover three drop eight since their pass rush wasn't getting home. 
Since the defense was tackling well, and since Haskins wasn't taking shots down the field, this would have forced him into second and long and third and long situations. The coverages that the Seahawks did call in the second half allowed Haskins to dink and dunk down the field, which is why this game all of a sudden got really close. I think better play calling would have slowed them down. Regardless, allowing 15 total points to an NFL team obviously isn't bad. I'm definitely not saying that. What I am saying is that this defense could have put this game away sooner. I didn't think it needed to be this close. You do have to give credit to Collar and Dunlap for their game ending sacks, but better coverage calls earlier in this game wouldn't have put them in this situation in the first place. Now, going back to Haskins, the main thing I have to say about him is that he largely took what was given. This can be seen by his absurd number of completions near the line of scrimmage. 44 of his 55 passes travel less than 10 yards. That's 80%, which is just crazy. Like I said before, the Seahawks did limit many of the big plays for a large part of this game. You can also never blame a quarterback for taking what's given. In my opinion, the final three drives were actually all pretty good by Haskins. If you would grade his first half at a D, his second half was probably a B. There was objective improvement throughout this game. However, what I didn't see in that improvement was upside. For as much talent as Haskins had coming out of college, I was just left wanting more. This to me is the entire crux of this issue. If Haskins was dominant and he pulled James Harden, this would definitely be different. That's clearly not the case here. Haskins has a lot to work on both on and off the field if he wants a fighting chance at becoming a franchise quarterback. Well, that's all I have for you in this one. I just want to say thank you so much for watching and make sure you subscribe to my channel below. If you want to support this channel directly, feel free to follow the link to my Patreon account as well. Thanks again, and for my latest updates, you can find me on Twitter at Samuel Argold.